Ben Franklin's World is a production of the Omohundro Institute. Hello, and welcome to episode 308 of Ben Franklin's World, the podcast dedicated to helping you learn more about how the people and events of our early American past have shaped the present day world we live in. And I'm your host, Liz Covart. Every year, there seems to be a handful of history books that cause a stir among historians. These are the books that historians can't seem to stop talking about. And at least once or twice a year, I try to place at least one of these books into our editorial calendar so that you can get an idea of what historians are talking about and what historical research seems most exciting to them. Well, today's conversation is about one of these most talked about books. It's called Wicked Flesh, Black Women, Intimacy, and Freedom in the Atlantic World. Now, in Wicked Flesh, Johns Hopkins University history professor Jessica Marie Johnson takes us into the Atlantic world of colonial New Orleans and Louisiana to show us how the story of freedom in colonial New Orleans tended to pivot on the choices that Black women made to retain control of their bodies, their families, and their futures. But how did Black women in colonial Louisiana navigate French and Spanish Black codes or slavery codes to retain control of their bodies, families, and futures? Well, during our conversation, Jessica will answer this question as well as reveal details about French entry into colonization and the diplomacy they needed to conduct to establish a trade with the West Coast of Africa. The place of colonial New Orleans and Louisiana within the larger world of Atlantic trade and colonization and information about the French Code Noir or Slave Code of 1685, and how African women and women of African descent navigated that code to create opportunities for freedom and control. But first, I'd like to take a moment to thank all of our new, past, and current subscribers to the Ben Franklin's World Subscription Program. Thank you, subscribers. My Omohundro Institute teammates and I really appreciate your support of our work and your help to keep this podcast going. If you're not yet a subscriber to the Ben Franklin's World Subscription Program and you'd like to be a subscriber, visit benfranklinsworld.com slash subscribe for more information. That's benfranklinsworld.com slash subscribe. All right, are you ready to check out one of the most talked about books in the field of early American history? Let's go meet our guest historian. Our guest is an assistant professor of history at Johns Hopkins University. She's a historian of Atlantic slavery and the Atlantic African diaspora. She's published numerous articles and an award-winning book, Wicked Flesh, Black Women, Intimacy, and Freedom in the Atlantic World. Welcome to Ben Franklin's World, Jessica Marie Johnson. Thank you so much for having me. Now, Jessica's book, Wicked Flesh, uses the history of Black women in New Orleans as a way to explore Black women's experiences across the Atlantic world. Jessica, I wonder if we could begin our conversation by having you tell us a bit about the geographic scope and time period for your work. Because you chose a rather expansive time period and geographic area, and you don't really just cover the history of New Orleans, you really cover the landscape of the Atlantic world. So could you tell us a bit about the geography and time period of your book? Yes, absolutely. The way that I decided to choose the kind of sites and the temporality of Wicked Flesh is very much geared around where I kind of wanted to end up. I really wanted to end up understanding a little bit more and the reader understand a little bit more about African women and women of African descent in Gulf Coast, Louisiana. And one of the ways I describe the kind of geography of the book is New Orleans Atlantic world. And so that for me in the archive and in sort of the genealogy of the Gulf Coast stretches from Senegambia, the Comtois of San Luis and Gore, through the Caribbean. And then we end up in some place like the Gulf Coast, where Africans are arriving, where French colonial officials and French administrators are trying to establish this outpost, this colonial outpost at the southernmost part of mainland North America and the southernmost reach of their North American colonial situation. And at a place that is, you know, connected in this kind of strange, like almost like not just a triangle, almost a kind of polygon in this 18th century moment. And so 
the concentration of the French slave trade from West Africa is so dominated by Senegambia that helped make sense as far as a Senegambian connection. The imperial provenance of France and French empire helped, you know, create a need to really analyze the ways that Louisiana fit into an archipelagic framework of the Caribbean. But I also try and be clear that, you know, this is how I'm describing New Orleans Atlantic world in this context and in this book and for these reasons. But there could also be a story of New Orleans Atlantic world and Black women in it that stretches from the Bight of Benin and around to Louisiana and through the Caribbean, particularly in the weight of the slave trade to Saint-Domingue. So there's many, many ways of thinking about the diasporas that end up in Gulf Coast, Louisiana. The temporality, in a similar way, was also structured by empire and by the genealogy of Louisiana and France's sort of incursions and developing understanding of the ways that they wanted to create a logic of slavery and slaveholding. So the book, when I talk about it, I talk about it as beginning in 1685 with the French Code d'Oie, which is the first imperial-wide slave code that is addressed specifically to the colonies. And it ends in 1809 and 1810 with the expulsion of the Saint-Domingue emigres from where they have landed in Cuba, expelled from Cuba with Napoleon's invasion of Spain. And one of the main places they go is Louisiana. It's close. It's formerly French or French enough. And it's a site that they find is very familiar and is already sort of part of their geographic understanding of what of safe spaces to go. So that's a lot of the chronology, which is funny because, you know, it actually also goes a little bit earlier as explaining the 1685 Code Noir requires going into some of the earlier 1670, 1680 codes and explaining, you know, why ending in the edge of the 19th century requires understanding a little bit about iconic figures that emerged in the 19th century, iconic figures of Black New Orleans womanhood, like Henriette de Lille and Marie Laveau. So there's some wiggle room there, which I think is kind of emblematic of New Orleans playing with boundaries at all points. So the history of New Orleans that we're talking about here is a history that covers the mid to late 17th century through the early part of the 19th century, and a history that views New Orleans' Atlantic world through its different trade and political connections. So it's viewing this world through its connections with different Caribbean islands, with France and Spain and Europe, and also with what sounds like were many different connections and places along the West Coast of Africa. Indeed, it does. The space that is Gulf Coast, Louisiana, is really kind of a constellation of sites that if you focus in on the site that becomes what we know as New Orleans, you can sort of see its relationship to a whole host of places that both make it and it makes others. So it's connected to San Louis, it's connected to Gray in what is now present day Senegal. There's ways it's connected to France and scholars have done amazing work on these connections, including Rebecca Scott and John Hebride on Rosalie Vincent and her descendants in France. It's connected to Saint-Domingue, Martinique, Guadeloupe. And it's connected, you know, there's a shift in empire in the 1760s. The Gulf Coast ends up being connected in surprising ways to Cuba. So it's a site that has so many interesting links to other histories and other enslaved and free Black communities and other empires and imperial ideas of bondage and of slaveholding, you know, and all of these things are emerging in this moment. In a lot of ways, the book is trying to think with how this is all a process, you know, like, so in a lot of ways, it's not saying that this is the definitive New Orleans Atlantic world or a definitive way to think about the emergence of slavery or Black community in Louisiana. It's not trying to say that this is the definitive way to think about plantation economies or the urban outposts. It's trying to chart a process by which slavery, slaveholding, the plantation complex, generations of captivity to take Ira Berlin's formulation, that these things are all emerging in this moment. And we have to be able to see them as not in stasis and not as binaries, but as a dynamic process that is happening in which Africans, enslaved people, and free people of African descent are absolutely key players and have things to say about the world that is emerging around them. Now, Wicked Flesh begins in West Africa and with an investigation of early interactions between West African and European traders. Jessica, would you tell us what life and trade were like in the West African region of Senegal during the 17th century? 
Yeah. So this is the beginnings in a lot of ways of French incursions into the Atlantic world. Like they begin in the 17th century, establishing themselves at St. Christophe. They begin trying to expand not just down the West African coast, but trying to establish themselves at outposts at Martinique, at Guadeloupe. I think by the end of 1697, I believe, is when they finally have really kind of got secure footing by saint And I mean secure because the French are latecomers in a lot of ways to the plantation colonization game. They're fighting for space from the British. They're fighting for space from the Spanish and the Portuguese. They are navigating, coming sort of behind and on the heels of the sugar revolution that's already happened, the tobacco revolution that the British take advantage of in the Chesapeake. So the French are really kind of navigating a world that they are trying to be, you know, major players in, but are significantly minor. So they arrive on the coast of present day Senegal and, you know, they are having to beat back the Portuguese. They literally go to a minor war with the Dutch in order to even secure enough security to establish themselves at San Luis and Gore and establish some kind of trade relations with the West African polities. And so theirs is a kind of insecure Atlantic regime. And on the other side, on the West African side, you have years of trade along the coast with the Portuguese, including slave trades. You have the Wolof, who are part of the changing dynamics of slaving in this region, includes navigating, you know, their diplomatic relations, either with coastal entities like Labu or entities further south who sort of resisted Wolof hegemony, like the Seer. And so they themselves have their own geopolitical issues to manage and to navigate. And they also have a kind of hegemony on the coast and at the Comtois in particular that mean that when they are facing and faced with trade with the French, the Portuguese or the Dutch, they have the monopoly of power. Like they say to the French, here you can rent, but you have to pay this amount. Here you can trade with us, but we're going to charge you duties on the rights to trade every year. And then we're going to charge you a tax on everything you wish to trade. Yes, you can occupy this part of the coastline, but you have to buy your subsistence grain from us and you have to offer various kinds of tributes. And so they have very much taken advantage of trade and secure alliances, treaties with the French that the French have, you know, really no choice but to abide by. And so it's a very interesting space for the French where they are really kind of trying to, you know, maintain and expand their imperial holdings and their imperial hold, while at the same time, you know, faced with the insecurity of being on the coast and having to engage in these diplomatic rituals and traditions. And that is in part the space that African women, free African women in particular, can enter into because they become part of these trade negotiations and their intimate partnerships with the French, with the Portuguese and Dutch as well, before the French become very much part of the practices of economic and geopolitical relations along this coast. You mentioned that the French trade with the Wolof, with the people of Senegal and Senegambia, was multifaceted, that they're trading more than just enslaved people. But how did the slave trade factor into this trade between the Senegalese and the French? And you also mentioned that women were crucial to facilitating this trade. So I wonder if you could provide us with a few examples of women's involvement in trade. For the French, it becomes pretty quickly primarily about trading in Africans. That's what they want. By 1715, you have Saint-Domingue surpasses Martinique as far as being a kind of prime destination for enslaved Africans and being a prime market for sugar and other kind of plantation economies. So the French as a body and as an empire in the West African coast are really, really interested in trading Africans. But that doesn't mean it's the only item that's being exchanged on the coast. Absolutely not. There's definitely, as part of this exchange and this commercial venture, There is a lot of trade in fabrics, in cotton in particular. There's trade in arms. There's trade in alcohol. There's trade in precious items. So one of the ways, to answer the other part of your question, one of the ways that African women play a particular kind of role, and I describe this role as the role of being a tastemaker, 
engaging with Samangaki Kandi's work is creating a kind of taste for status and that status looking like European goods along the coast. So taste for campanas that you can only acquire by trading in this Atlantic commerce. Trade in gold jewelry becomes an aesthetic marker of femininity, of status that African women cultivate and desire and want to trade for. It even extends in a lot of ways, and you see this increasingly moving into the later part of the 18th century, architecture, the kinds of materials that are brought to the coast in order to build homes and buildings and the kinds of architecture that is being created and innovated on. And so you have a range of trade goods that are exchanged in the West African context that are not a single item like Africans leaving the coast to head to West into the Atlantic world, but are characteristic of the kinds of commercial desires and needs that are being expressed by Wolof and other polities. I'd like for us to look at one aspect of this varied trade between the Senegalese and the French, and that is the aspect that involved enslaved Africans traveling from Senegal to the French colony of New Orleans. Now, the first documented arrival of an enslaved African woman in Louisiana is dated 1721. Jessica, you note in your book, Wicked Flesh, that before these women ever arrived in Louisiana, they endured La Traversée. Could you take us into the life of one of the women that you write about in Wicked Flesh and tell us about her experience in La Traversée? Absolutely, yes. So one of the women that I talk about in the book is a woman named Maribo who is a free African woman living at San Louis, and she's married to a French gunsmith. And through a whole series of events that are much more interesting when you read them in the book, her husband is deported to Louisiana, and she ends up on a slave ship following him. So I talk about her as this free African woman. She was on the ship with three of her own enslaved property, and she appears in this ship register as, you know, a free mulatres, uh, just as a passenger. And this was not uncommon to have passengers on slave ships. It was not an unknown thing. And these ships made multiple stops. So there's not a kind of one stop from one side of the Atlantic to the other in this voyage. So Marie Baud ends up embarking from San Louis. Many of the ships that left San Louis would do a kind of refueling stop at Gore for water and subsistence items before either heading further down the West African coast to secure more enslaved Africans or heading across the Atlantic. Even that stop itself was not going to guarantee that you have enough supplies across the Atlantic. So most ships also would, at some point in the Gulf Coast and the Caribbean, would also do at least one other stop. French slave ships en route to Louisiana tended to stop at Grenada. That was always an interesting stop because one of the things that ports on this side of the Atlantic would do, particularly smaller ones who might not see slave ships except for refueling purposes. They would require slave ship captains to refuel by also trading their enslaved people from their cargo, quote unquote cargo, for enslaved people that the portmaster or lieutenant at the outpost might have. So you had those kinds of instances as well. So these are trips that have multiple stops. They're two or three months in duration. So before you have that kind of refueling stop on the Atlantic side, you might have been at sea for a month and a half, two months. And those stops also, you know, were opportunities to regroup. The voyages are interesting because we talk about the captives as we should, suffering from dysentery, scurvy, measles, a whole host of illnesses would afflict enslaved Africans on these ships. But as we know, illness, disease is very promiscuous. And so crews, ship captains, all could be subject to illness that is spreading on the ship, to malnutrition, to starvation. All could drown, all could suffer from hurricanes and storms and die from those kinds of causes. So you have these stops that become opportunities to regroup, usually giving those on the ship an opportunity to rest. The crew could come offshore, et cetera. But there also might be opportunities where crew needs to get replenished. So people on the shore who might have an opportunity to get employment on one of these ships because there have been too many deaths. Somewhere after that first refueling stop, these Louisiana slave ships would land in 
either Ship Island, Biloxi, some of them made their way around and through Lake Pontchartrain and would land above New Orleans. But they would usually land somewhere just a little bit further away from the town and then canoes would take captives and passengers, crew to further on into the city. And then if they were heading to plantations further up the Mississippi River to Natchez. So these are drawn out journeys. They don't feel short when you're on them. They don't feel safe. They are unpleasant experiences, even for a free passenger like Maribode and devastating experiences for our captives themselves. For Maribode's story, she arrives and encounters a world in which slavery and patriarchy have positioned her as no longer sort of a free African woman who has a particular kind of status and a network, a social network in Senegambia. Now she's, you know, the wife of this gunsmith and she suffers as a result of it. But I talk about her as a way to talk about some of the granular details of these passages, which can be so hard and so devastating and so objectively terrible to everybody who is involved, free or unfree. Okay, so say you're Marie Bode or one of her enslaved women, and you've just arrived in New Orleans in 1721. What kind of place and environment did these women arrive in? I mean, you mentioned that it was a place with a strong patriarchy, but what did Louisiana and New Orleans look like in 1721? So there's a great line that I believe is a Jean Poget, but I don't have it right in front of me, where he describes, you know, this outpost is like a hundred huts, some scraped together boards and planks. <laughs> it's muddy, it's sweaty, you know, most of the year. It's frosty when it's actually winter. It floods all of the time. Like, this is not a pleasant place to live. It's not luxurious. It's not even entirely constructed. So the space that Africans are landing, that someone like Marie Bode is landing, is a hard place to occupy. <laughs> there's mosquitoes. Like, it's just, when people talk about it, when people write about it, it's really interesting because there's a way that people talk about this glamour of New Orleans, which I think is absolutely true in the 19th century. But in its earlier moments, it really is just a muddy outpost that even the French themselves, those who are coming over as French settlers and engagés or indentured laborers, they come and a lot of them leave. There's a significant outmigration. People do not want to stay on the coast. There's not even like the enticement of plantation agriculture because they can't figure out how to get tobacco oriented. And people seem not sure that they're interested in that because there's also this trade that's happening between the French and French Canadian fur traders. And that seems like maybe it's more lucrative. It's a bit of a messy prospect along the coast. And that's the world that African women enslaved Africans are landing in. They're also landing in a world that is not dominated by the French. Like this is very much native ground. And I'm taking that framing from Kathleen Duval. It's a world in which indigenous nations have the provenance and they are able to, in a lot of ways, dictate a lot of the diplomatic relations and diplomatic policies and politics that are happening. And so not only are Africans contending with French, who would be slave owners and would be colonial masters, they're also navigating and having to learn and grapple with a whole new polity, whether it's the Natchez or the Choctaw or various Petit Nation, which is the smaller nations, as how they're described by the French. There's a whole new constellation of allies and potential enemies and them as a vulnerable population now as enslaved people having to figure out how to manage all of that. So this sounds like a very interesting and rustic place where these free and enslaved <laughs> Black women end up. The landscape still needs to be developed into a proper urban area. It's hot, it's swampy, it's mosquito-ridden, and it's really a Native world, a Native space yeah. where Native Americans were really calling the shots in terms of peace, war, and trade. And amidst all this, this is where you have the center of this burgeoning French colonial world. And as part of this colonial society, is something that you mentioned earlier, the Code Noir, which is really responsible for shaping French colonial society in New Orleans. Now, we need to take a moment for our episode sponsor, but when we get back, Jessica, I'd really like for you to help us investigate the Code Noir. This episode is brought to you by the Omohundro Institute, proud publishers of award-winning books since 1943. In a celebrated account of the origins of American unity, 
John Adams described July 1776 as the moment when 13 clocks struck at the same time. But once these clocks struck, how did the American colonies overcome long odds to create a durable union capable of declaring and keeping independence from Great Britain? In a powerful new history of the 15 tense months that culminated in the Declaration of Independence, historian Robert Parkinson provides a troubling answer, racial fear. In his new book, 13 Clocks, Parkinson traces the circulation of information in the colonial news systems, systems that linked patriot leaders with average colonists. Parkinson reveals how participants in these news systems constructed a compelling drama featuring virtuous men who suddenly found themselves threatened by ruthless Indians and defiant slaves, all acting on behalf of the king. 13 Clocks was published by the Omohundro Institute and their publishing partner, the University of North Carolina Press. And 13 Clocks is available now in paperback for the low price of $20. If you want to read what one scholar calls the most original work on 1776 in a generation, then check out 13 Clocks by Robert Parkinson, available now in paperback for $20. You can purchase your copy of 13 Clocks by visiting benfranklinsworld.com slash clocks. That's benfranklinsworld.com slash clocks. Jessica, could you tell us about the Code Noir and how these enslaved women who came to New Orleans in 1721 would have felt and experienced this code in their everyday lives? Absolutely. So the French first passed the 1685 Code Noir, and that has various permutations depending on the colonial response, because they also have a kind of backdoor sort of rule where the different superior councils and local councils at the outposts could, you know, certify or not certify rules that are coming from France. And generally, superior councils tended to certify, but sometimes, you know, they might not. And then local superior councils who are the governing bodies of French empire might also decide to pass further rules. So between 1685 and 1724, which you have Louisiana Cote Noir, in the Caribbean, there have been various modifications and revisions of that original Cote Noir, a tightening of various restrictions. So changes to who can be free, changes to who can inherit, restrictions on ordinances and edicts passed locally that say, if you marry a Black woman, not just African, but a Black woman, you'll lose your titles or you won't be able to serve in the military, you know, things that basically create de facto bans on marriage, marriage that would have been allowed, but in fact, was presumably kind of a door to manumission in the original Code Noir. So this is important to understand because it's this context, this archipelagic legal context, and a scholar who's amazing at this is Sylvia Vidal and talking about this work in Caribbean New Orleans. It's this archipelagic context that creates the conditions for the formation and the promulgation of the 1724 Louisiana Code Noir. And this Code Noir looks a lot like what slave codes will look like in the 18th century and becomes the Code Noir in a lot of ways that other colonies, particularly in the French Empire, model themselves after. So it's very clearly and rigidly part of sequitur ventrum, the status of the enslaved person follows the mother. It sets out various rules for, you know, what happens if you run away, the physical punishment, it sets out rules for free people of color. If they are harboring enslaved people, they're punished. It sets out rules for and against marriage. It sets out rules that require, you know, the respect of free people of color, even though you have been freed. So now there's a presumption that if you are Black and free, not that you are African and arrived as free. Now there's a presumption that if you are Black, you must have been enslaved. So your freedom now is sort of contingent on a previous slave status, a redemption, as you might say, from enslaved status. Now you, because of that, or out of that logic, you forever owe your former master's allegiance and respect and obedience. So you have a whole new set of rules that come into play. Again, this is the world and these are the rules that enslaved people are landing in. So women who are arriving are arriving in a world in which, you know, who they can have partnerships with is incredibly restricted. Their access to securing manumission now is incredibly restricted the ways that they are able to form families and who they can also for scrutiny. And they're also incredibly savvy with how they try and figure out, okay, well, what are the rules? You have Marie-Louise 
who petitions for her freedom based on rules in the Code Noir. You have some of the first petitions for freedom are presented to Superior Council by enslaved people who claim that, you know, like, oh, I was free in this context because it was part of somebody's testament when they passed away that I would be free. So there's an increased knowledge and a very clear sort of legal understanding and awareness of what the rules might be as far as their safety and their security. And I think that's actually also something really, really interesting, both that they are entering this milieu where to be Black is to be a slave, it is to be presumed to be in bondage. And even if you might possibly be free, it is presumed to then also require you be obedient and respectful to any white person who may cross your path. So there's that. And then there's also the ways that knowing that and figuring that out becomes a very deliberate practice of freedom that is engaged in by Africans who are arriving from a whole different context. I think that's one of the reasons it was important to kind of really stress the experience of La Traverse sets the stage for entering a whole new reality, but not one that is insurmountable and not one that Africans sort of, you know, were resigned to. They absolutely were creative and dynamic and aggressive about trying to figure out how to find a state of freedom as they defined it and keep it and maintain it against incursions of slave owners and colonial officials. So the Code Noir was really designed to be a series of laws that controlled the lives and movement of enslaved and free Black Africans in French New Orleans. And it also seems like, although it probably wasn't designed this way, that enslaved and free Africans and people of African descent really had a pretty great knowledge of this code. Because as you described it, they always seem to be looking for ways to use the code noir to gain their freedom and to find new opportunities, you know, to achieve freedom as they saw it. So Jessica, could you talk a bit more about how enslaved and free Black Africans and people of African descent would have developed their legal knowledge of the Code Noir and how the code itself changed from 1724 to the end of your story, which is in the 19th century? So one of the things that becomes really clear in how the code sort of develops is the code itself, you know, is the 1724 code. But as, <laughs> as enslaved people make various claims for freedom, petition the governor and the intendant, for manumission in various terms, gather with their family members in order to secure manumission or defend manumission that they say has been bequeathed to them, it becomes clear to officials that restrictions need to be tight. <laughs> so one of the things that I discuss in Wicked Flesh is the ways that police codes become another mechanism for controlling the enslaved population. And I should be clear, it's not just in controlling the enslaved population. There is a desire by colonial administrators in particular to control all ungovernables. So free people of color and enslaved people, free people of color, enslaved people, and also the savages, those of indigenous nations. Them as well as Germans who are arriving, Canary Islanders who end up arriving over the course of the 18th century, particularly in the Seven Years' War. So you have like a whole host of peoples and peopledom that French imperial officials are struggling to control. But the bulk of the laws and the letter of the law tends to fall heavily on enslaved people. So one of the slave codes I talk about is the 1751 police code that Governor Vaudreuil establishes and the mechanisms that that code offers to control movements, to add curfews to the town. Because now by the 1750s, it's really kind of increasing into a town context to control who can sell what to who, to try and control the markets that have popped up on the levee or in different parts of town. So moving from, in a lot of ways, more strictly sort of almost economic slave control, like status will follow the mother and here is how many rations you got and here are the rules about making sure that they do not do work on Sundays, you know, so that they can honor the Sabbath. Making sure that there's rules in the code about making sure that you don't sell enslaved people are in families, which slave owners, more than you would imagine, actually tried to follow. Moving from that, from like slave maintenance to, you know, general policing of the quote unquote unruly population. And that mounted in a lot of ways to controlling movement, 
controlling access to resources, controlling what Daniel Usner describes as a frontier exchange economy, controlling access to what we're becoming mechanisms for freedom and for freedom practices and the roots of things like marinage or if you can go sell your own items and you may be able to secure enough funds for self-purchase. So you have that kind of evolution there. There's an interesting change in the shift from the French to the Spanish. The Spanish also have a kind of set of rules and their own system for understanding and for controlling enslaved populations. But even they too end up being kind of confounded <laughs> by this African, African descended now by a couple of generations, various tiers of unruly Europeans, masterless men and women in this context. And they too pass codes that try to you know, leverage some kind of control. And those codes also fall heavily on enslaved and free women of African descent. So one of the key ones that I try and point to is the Bando de Buen Gobierno, which is, among other things, today people describe as the code that generated the Tignon law, the law preventing free women of African descent from wearing particular kinds of headgear. So in this kind of you know, evolution, now we're not just controlling movement, we're actually controlling bodies. <laughs> so there's this continued like, pressure like from the top down to try and find ways to curtail the expressive practices of people of African descent, you know, the ways that they're able to move and navigate. And that tells us as historians that there are ways that these are mechanisms that officials are identifying as potential gateways to other kinds of insurrection, other kinds of manumission, other kinds of freedom. But that also tells us that these are things, I'll put it like this, you don't pass a law on something that is not happening. And so these are practices and expressions that Africans are engaging in and that they themselves are doing for, in some ways, their own purposes and in some ways as measures and once again, pushing that kind of boundary of what gets counted as free, what enslaved people are or are not supposed to do and the ways that, you know, enslaved people are supposed to comport themselves as bonded laborers. Africans are defying that. And these codes as they roll out shows that and also shows in some ways administrators also increasing savvy in trying to tamp that down. It does sound like the Code Noir became more restrictive over time because, as you said, people of African and African descent were finding ways to assert their identities by defying the laws and also finding loopholes that they could use to create additional opportunities and avenues to freedom. And we know they must have been quite successful in finding a lot of loopholes to exploit because, Jessica, in your book, Wicked Flesh, you talk about the development of free Black communities and how Black women were able to create their own sense of freedom, their own concepts of freedom. So could you tell us about the development of free Black life in colonial New Orleans and about what freedom meant to the enslaved African and African-descended women who lived in this developing settlement? Absolutely, because I think this is one of the key interventions that I really want to make in how we think about freedom in this era. I call the book Black Women Intimacy and Freedom in the Atlantic World. I don't call it Black Women Intimacy and Slavery in the Atlantic World because I think that one of the things that we have gotten better at and still need to do better with is thinking about the rise of slavery, the rise of plantations as a process, the plantation complex, or slave societies and societies with slaves. Like We have formulations and language for describing how this happens over time and that it's a dynamic process and nothing is in stasis. I don't think we do as well doing that when we're talking about freedom. And so one of the things I wanted to stress are the ways that African women and women of African descent are themselves thinking about what freedom means in the context of a slaveholding society. And they're thinking about it in many different ways. So when I'm talking about free African women in the West African context, they're thinking about the freedom to be tastemaker, to be a patron or to have patronage, the freedom to engage in trade, the freedom to own slaves. And often they were owning enslaved women. So they're talking about these are the things that secure safety and autonomy for me and my family, for me and the people who I've decided and claimed as kin. And I think if we think about that in some ways as a measure of what freedom is, we actually see different conversations, I'll say, about freedom happening 
even among Black women within the enslaved and free Black communities. So you see enslaved women who are petitioning for their freedom and saying, you know, this slavery thing is a trick. Marie Louise says that quite explicitly. She's like, slavery is a trick. You should not hold a free woman as a trick. You have in 1731, there's a slave conspiracy and there's a woman involved in it. And this woman articulates the success of the conspiracy as her then being able to name herself. She's going to take a new name and her name is going to be Madame Perrier. And Etienne Perrier is the governor. So she's essentially saying the marker of her freedom is to be a head woman, is to be an aristocrat, is to be someone who is as powerful, essentially, as the governor. And then you also have other ways of expressing and manifesting freedoms that are even challenging to ideas of empire. You have the expression and the acts of women defending each other. Louisan and Babette, who defend each other against a sexually harassing an abusive soldier who actually attacks them. You have the woman Taka who defends her time, essentially, against her husband, who wants her time for himself. So you have all of these different ways of thinking about how do I expand and control my autonomy, my body? How do I secure safety and security for my people? And those are not one story and they're not even one story that you can just sort of slide across the 18th century and say, well, this is what freedom therefore means. They're about the way that thinking about something that is not slavery is a thinking that happens over the course of the 18th century and evolves and changes in a whole host of complicated ways. So that by the time you get to the 1780s and 90s, you have instances where now women who were enslaved and maybe are a couple of generations from slavery are now owning other enslaved people. So that's the change, that's the shift, that's a process, and it has its own history. And this book tries to chart out how that history happens and how we might be able to understand it when we're talking about this thing called freedom that is also so resonant and seems so European, and I'd argue actually is not. We see this over and over again, where imperial officials have this kind of abstract and yet also kind of concrete idea of how to control their vast imperial holdings. So. They pass something like the Code Noir Acts. But on the ground, you have actual living people who, as you mentioned, don't always abide by the letter of the law or by imperial definitions of freedom because they are out there trying to carve out what they see as their own autonomy and their own bits of freedom from these acts of control. So how do colonial French and later colonial Spanish society in Louisiana and along the larger Gulf Coast How do these societies react to this interplay between the empire's desire to control people and the people's desire to live their lives as free and as autonomous as possible? You know, this question could go a lot of different ways. And this is why I like it, because on the one hand, you have, you know, enslaved people who are at all times, they are determined to do what they feel like they would like to do. So just the act of running away itself is an affront against the rules of bondage, the rules that slave owners are placing on enslaved people. The rise of marinage bands in the cypress swamps around New Orleans, the access that enslaved people have to rivers and to maritime knowledge as those who are piloting pirogues and canoes, all of these are mechanisms for bucking the rules. But what's interesting about looking at the Atlantic world from the history of slavery is that you actually see people at all levels, <laughs> colonial outposts, trying to pull against the supposed boundaries of their world. You have governors who are pushing the bounds of their authority <laughs> and doing actions and asking for permission later. So the whole establishment of New Orleans by Governor Bienville is in some ways a site that he decided was going to be the outpost, was going to be the colonial city. And he just sort of, he would get pushback from his other colonial officials just sort of kind of apologize somewhere in France that, oh, sorry, I didn't know that you meant that other place mobile. I thought you meant New Orleans. <laughs> like, and that's a colonial story. And in some ways, our imperial histories have imagined that there is a rule that's decided like the Code Noir, and then it's just become sort of the basis for life on the ground. But actually, on the ground, I think, is where the action is. And on the ground is what, in a lot of ways, is pushing decisions that are happening above. And Louisiana becomes an amazing site for that. So not just enslaved people, but French settlers, 
who are themselves engaging in various incident partnerships with Indigenous and African women, Indigenous who are playing the French and the British and other European imperial entities against each other for their own purposes. Everyone is trying to slide by the rules of empire and use it for their own purposes. The difference with looking at from the history of slavery is that enslaved people are the ones who are especially vulnerable and set up in this structure to be especially precarious. So the changing rules are some of the most interesting and fun parts of following these stories in the archive. Now, as we mentioned at the start, Wicked Flesh is a story of African and African-descended women and their interactions with French and Spanish slavery in New Orleans and along the colonial Gulf Coast region. Jessica, why do you think it's important that we study the experiences of enslaved and free Black women broadly? And why do you think we should study their experiences across the Atlantic world and even across the colonial Americas? I think that it is difficult to really do early North American history without understanding the ways that gender and race and gender and Blackness in particular play a pivotal role in how this new world develops. And the easy response is, of course, part of sequitur ventrum and the ways that reproduction really structures social relations and political possibilities in new world societies. But there are so many other ways that understanding the history of African women and women of African descent tells us something really, really important about what is happening on the ground and in these broader histories, tells us something more about the geopolitics. An example I could give is after the 1729 Natchez revolt, where the Natchez Indians massacre, by estimates, 200 European men, women, and children. They're trying to take back their territory from the French, who are trying to turn it into plantation country. In the wake of that, two institutions emerge in Louisiana that have sort of been seen as like these separate institutions. But actually, you know, in the wake of this, we can see if we're looking at it from the context of where are African women, we actually can see some interesting relationships to empire there. So one institution is a free Black militia, which the legacies of that are in Etienne de Perrier charging enslaved Black men from New Orleans, from the outpost of New Orleans, to not just fight against the Natchez, but to massacre various petite nations around the town, an eventual possible exchange for their freedom. And the other institution that emerges is the Ursuline Convent, which the Ursulines have been around for, I believe they arrived in 1724. So they've been around for a few years before that, but they weren't getting the support and resources from the Superior Council and from the colonial officials that they do in the wake of the Natchez War, where you have a sudden influx of women and children who are now orphaned from Natchez and who better in the French you know, imperial mindset to take care of widowed women and orphaned children than nuns. You have these two institutions that get created and they sort of been seen as like, oh, it's, it's separate. And, you know, like, look at these institutions and how they appear. But what happens if we look at it from the perspective of African women and women African descent, we can actually see the ways that these are two institutions that emerge with a particular idea of freedom, freedom as charity or freedom as intimacy with the bloody work of empire. And nowhere there is an institution that's devoted particularly to Black women, to African women, Black women and girls, Black womanhood. You could say, you know, the free Black militia, they benefit their wives. And in fact, a lot of their wives do secure freedom because the men are able to leverage their apprenticeships and their labor to secure freedom for their wives. And you could say that African women are being catered to as charges of the Ursulines. But there's not a particular institution for them itself. And so it tells us something about what freedom and charity mean in this world, what those things will come to mean in the context of 19th century abolitionist ideas about what freedom, civic society, citizenship are supposed to do in an increasingly modernizing world and the role that Black people play in that. And it also tells us something about the ways that African women are being rendered invisible at the intersection. Like literally, it's a perfect example of Kimberly Crenshaw's formulation of intersectionality and the ways that, you know, the limits of possibility when it comes to empire and the ways that that can be so truncated. And so I think those are the kinds of things that give us different histories of those two institutions, looking at it from the context of African women and girls. And we need to do that with a lot of our institutions more than likely, because if we're going to 
have histories that are explanatory of whole populations and the wholeness of populations, and we need to do a better job of actually seeing how these institutions are actually connected. We should jump into the time warp. Duh. This is a fun segment of the show where we ask you a hypothetical history question about what might have happened if something had occurred differently or if someone had acted differently. Jessica, what might have happened if African women had not been involved in the slave trade? How might the history of Atlantic slavery be different if African women had not been enslaved? You know, this is <laughs> not an easy question and not a question that I'm sure, you know, has the happy ending either. So not having African women involved in the slave trade, being enslaved means that you don't have part of sequitur ventrum. It doesn't mean that you don't have slavery, though. You know, it may mean that you have a kind of bondage that looks a lot more like the kinds of unfreedoms that are circulating within the West African context. So I'm thinking of the Wolof employed slaves, quote unquote, slaves as soldiers in the Sado, the royal army. So you might end up having unfreedoms that operate in that capacity. And if you really are staying true to the counterfactual and women are really not allowed to or do not end up in the Atlantic world, then you also don't have a reproducing African population. That doesn't mean, you know, that you don't necessarily have a reproducing enslaved population because you also have indigenous polities that are in their own conflicts with Europeans. You have indigenous slavery. So does it mean that you have now Afro-Indigenous or an even more Afro-Indigenous enslaved population than we've already charted in our histories, that's possible as well. And on the West African side, do you have, as a result of population loss or shifting polities or even shifting ideas of gender as a result of that kind of gender-focused slave trade, you might have an even more female-headed and centered political institutions. So you do have aristocratic roles for women in Wolof context in particular. Do those expand because of the draw of the slave trade to African men? I don't know. But those are the kind of things that kind of come to mind with a kind of question like this. What does not come to mind is freedom. I do not see, with the structure of this question, I do not see a context where taking women out of the equation means that slavery somehow dies out or freedom is secure. I think that there is something massive about the appetite for sugar, coffee, tobacco, and other goods in this moment that could beget slaveholding complex. And that is what the evil was there. I'm not sure that we have yet unpacked that. Like you said, not necessarily a happy ending. No, unfortunately, not necessarily a happy ending at all. Now, Jessica, do you have a research project that you're working on now? I do. My second book is a book about the ways that Blackness history and the digital operate in cahoots together. So it's looking at history as in the historical profession and how people are thinking about the past, particularly African-Americans, Black communities, Black diasporic communities think about the past and how they situate themselves in relationship to a past that is a slave past. And also how that operates in a context where so much of the conversation about slavery, our history, our memory of it, our conversation about monuments, about commemoration, our oral histories, so much of it is also happening in relationship to what is circulating online. And so I'm very, very interested in the rise and fall of monuments. I'm very, very interested in what conversations among archivists around community archiving and oral histories I'm very interested in how COVID is reshaping our relationship to the screen, but also our relationship to kinship and family and gatherings, gatherings being spaces where stories about the past are often told. And I'm also interested in how historians have written about slavery in the past. I know that how the history of slavery, how the lives of Black people have been written about by professional historians has changed significantly in the last 60, 70, 80 years. And we don't have a good history of that since Myron Rudwick's 
Black history and historical profession. And even that wasn't focused on the history of slavery. So it's looking at all of these questions and trying to get at, you know, what are the ways that we can understand better the role that this history plays in our profession, but also keeping that in conversation with how Black people understand the role that slavery plays in their lives and in their homes. That sounds like another expansive project across many different media. It is. It absolutely is. Yes, I cannot seem to (laughs) do a straight line to save my life, but I'm hoping that it'll be interesting and of interest to people. Now, what if we have more questions about enslaved women in colonial New Orleans and Louisiana? What is the best place to get in contact with you? I tweet on Twitter more often than I should at JMJAFRX, JMJ Afrix. You're also, you know, welcome to explore any of my digital projects. You can find me at lifexcode.org, where I direct a digital humanities initiative around decolonial and anti-racist praxis. I also co-direct electricmarinage.com, Dayet Electric Marinage, with Dr. Yomaira Figueroa. And you can explore some of my random ruminations and thoughts over at my blog, dh.jmjafrix.com. And you co-host a book club, a virtual book club. Could you tell us more about this book club and how we can join or participate in it? Oh, yes, please do. In cahoots with Ana Lucia Arrujo, Vanessa Holden, and Alex Gill, we run the Slavery Archive Book Club, which we started because of COVID. You know, so again, this is one of those examples of like COVID changing, really reshaping how we relate to history, historical material, and slavery. The Slavery Archive Book Club runs on Wednesdays in the evening definitely once a month, sometimes more than once a month. And we feature books on slavery and the history of slavery, history of the Atlantic world. We've done books about memory and museums. And we are doing some work even in slavery and digital humanities, early American digital humanities. So if you are interested in following and in joining the book club, slaveryarchive.wordpress.com has the whole listing. And I believe it might even be updated with Falls listing, which is going to be Super exciting listing. And if you have a book that you'd like to pitch, please email. You can email me, J M like Mary J at jhu.edu. Jessica Marie Johnson, thank you for helping us form a better understanding of the experiences of enslaved and free African and African descended women in New Orleans's Atlantic world. Thank you so much for having me on Ben Franklin's World. What's really interesting about looking at the Atlantic world through the history of slavery is that we actually get to see people at all social and economic spectrums trying to push the supposed boundaries of their world. Take the French 1685 Code Noir, for instance. What we're really getting a glimpse of is a list of activities that free and enslaved Black people were already engaging in, and that French colonists and other officials really wanted them to stop engaging in. For example, the Code Noir reveals that free and enslaved African women and women of African descent were marrying white colonists to achieve manumission, that enslaved women were using legal loopholes to obtain freedom for their children, and that enslaved Blacks were using the assistance of free Blacks to run away from their masters and enslavers. We can also see this boundary pushing on the other side of the French Atlantic, just as Jessica detailed for us. The French had two trading outposts in the Senegambia region of West Africa in present-day Senegal. One outpost was at San Louis, and the other was at Goree. At these outposts, the French had to be more open to working with Africans and African women as important traders. The Wolof people demanded that the French trade fabrics, arms, and alcohol with them. And Wolof women served as important trading partners as they set the taste for trade goods. The active participation of women in the African trade saw French men really having to push past the boundaries of their patriarchal society and cultural norms. So looking at the history of places, peoples, and events through slavery allows us to see old events in new ways and to see aspects of places and people in ways that we just couldn't see before. As Jessica stated, it is difficult to investigate and truly understand early North American history without also understanding the ways that race, gender, and blackness played pivotal roles in how this colonial world developed. And it's impossible to write histories that represent and speak for all peoples if we truly don't have an idea of how all peoples experience the different worlds of early North America. You'll find more information about Jessica, her book, Wicked Flesh, plus notes and links for everything we talked about today on the show notes page. 
benfranklinsworld.com slash 308. Friends tell friends about their favorite podcasts. So if you enjoy Ben Franklin's World, please tell your friends and family about it. Production assistance for this podcast comes from the Omahundro Institute's digital audio team. Joseph Edelman, Martha Howard, Holly White, and Karen Wolf. Breakmaster Cylinder composed our custom theme music. This podcast is part of the Airwave Media Podcast Network. To discover and listen to their other podcasts, visit airwavemedia.com. Finally, what history book have you read or what history museum or historic site have you visited that you think more people should be talking about? I'm always on the lookout for new episode topics, so please let me know. Liz at benfranklinsworld.com. Ben Franklin's World is a production of the Omahundro Institute.